These classes are sponsored by the Hanan Fund. And this week, they're commemorating the yard site of their patriarch, Reb Chaikel Hanan, who is one of the most prominent Balabatim in Crown Heights, who was a, a, a real Isaac B'Tzach Hetzibah Bermuna during his long and very eventful and fruitful life. I want to begin the class with a story that he would tell frequently, and it's a story that uh, reflects some of the uh, temperament of the person, and it's a story with an incredible message. And uh, let this be a uh, schus for his neshama. When he was a young man, and still single, he lived in Leningrad, which is one of the larger cities in Soviet Russia, and he was quite involved in all the important things that were going on. He uh, was involved with the shul, involved with the community, and so forth. And he was once recruited by Lubavitcher Hasidim to make a trip to Moscow in order to resolve a uh, curiosity that they had. And it was important that he should not be identified officially and obviously as a Lubavitcher Hasid. And apparently, at that particular point in his life, he was able to pass for just a Jewish public servant as opposed to a Lubavitcher Hasid. The story behind this mission is quite intriguing. The community of Moscow had lost its rov. The rabbi had passed away. And a new rabbi needed to be appointed, and there were several candidates. Amongst the candidates was a Hasidic sherov named Rafal Khan. And naturally, the Lubavitcher Hasidim were in favor of electing a rov from their own community. Another candidate was a graduate of the great uh, Litvish yeshiva, Navardik, which is a Oilamish uh, yeshiva, non Hasidic yeshiva, with a very, very strong Musar emphasis. A Jew by the name of Yaakov Clements, who was a, a, an incredible Gordon, a great, great Talmud Chacham. And as the Hasidim would later find out, a, a, a partner in the previous Rebbe's underground activities to preserve Yiddishkeit in Russia. But at the time, the Hasidim didn't know this. And the Lubavitcher Hasidim in Moscow assumed that they would vote for the Hasidic candidate and they put all their efforts into seeing that he be elected. Several days prior to the election, the previous Rebbe sent a telegram that they vote for Harav Clemens, which the Hasidim did, and naturally he was elected. But this intrigued Hasidim. Why would the previous Rebbe encourage Hasidim to vote for an Oilem Sharov at a time that the position of Rav was incredibly sensitive? You needed to have great wisdom, great uh, human skills, and of course, more than anything else, sealed lips to hold this position, and the previous Rebbe would encourage them to elect Haraf Clemens. So they sent the then young Chaikel Hanan to Moscow to find out who this Rav was. And he managed somehow to get himself invited to Haraf Clemens' house, and he was his guest for days. And um, it allowed him to see him up close and personal and to, uh, to figure out what kind of human being he was. And uh, he witnessed two events which were sufficient to uh, enlighten him as to why the previous Rebbe had encouraged them to vote for an Oilem uh, A posh at the Yid, a simple elderly fellow, came in to Harav Clemens, to the new Moscovite Rav, with a dilemma. And he said, I've been working in a factory all my life, I had this position, and uh, I've reached the stage in my life where I've, if I don't come in on Shabbos, my life is going to be destroyed. I mean, the least of my problems will be that I'll lose my job, they'll accuse me of being a parasite, they'll do who knows what. I, I've got to go into work on Shabbos. I've never been Machal Shabbos in my life. What should I do? So Araf Clement sat with this Yid and talked about the Ereises and the Rabbonans, bigger transgressions, smaller transgressions, and created a plan for this man to be able to go to work on Shabbos without violating Yisudim the Ereis, serious transgressions. And he encouraged him. When this person heard this suggestion, and he had a plan of how to approach what he would and wouldn't do on Shabbos in his place of work, he burst into tears and he said, you know, I've been keeping my Shabbos, Shabbos all my life. Why is Hashem putting me through this test? And when Hav Clemens saw this Yid cry, he cried with him. And the two of them cried together. A few days later, the same exact event repeated itself. A Yid came in, and he said he works at a factory and he's been working there for many years and if he doesn't begin coming in on Shabbos, it won't only be that he'll lose his livelihood, he'll probably end up in Siberia. 
The second person was a scholar, however, and he knew Hilchas Shabbos, and he had worked out all the hetedim. He, he came to the rabbi prepared, as it were, to explain to the rabbi what he would be allowed to do and what he wouldn't be allowed to do it and how he would do it and so forth. Haraf Clemens heard him out, and Chaikal, as he was called, witnesses this, and he thinks that the, the rabbi is going to repeat the same performance he had done last time and separate the Isis from the Rabbonans and tell him what's more important, less important. But instead, Hadaf Clemens stood up, pounded his fist on the table and said, absolutely not. You are Kadyetsky Corpus and it's expected of you to be Moshe Nefesh for Shabbos. He says, Kein heter of Chil Shabbos vesto for me You will not receive a heter, a permission to partially desecrate the Shabbos from me. And he very emotionally told that person, go, don't go to work on Shabbos, that the cards fall over the mayor. You're a Jew, you can't desecrate the Shabbos. When this Jew left, <coughs> it took Haraf Clemens a period of time to actually calm down. And when he calmed down, Heichel says to him, Rebbe, a few days ago somebody else was here. And you, you empathized with him, you talked him through the Eraisis and the Rabbonans, how he could keep Shabbos without violating major transgressions. You cried with him. Here another Jew comes in with the same issue, and your response was so incredibly different. And he tells them, Haraf Clement says, let me tell you what Kadeski Corpus means, he says. He says that the Tsarist government had a, a special group of soldiers whose duty it was to protect the king's person. And these were elite soldiers whose training began in infancy. They would literally adopt them as children. They'd be fed the best food, given the best accommodations, and given the most ideal lives. And their entire upbringing revolved around being trained to protect the king. These were the elite soldiers. And there's an assumption that these elite soldiers who were given all this privilege um, are expected to be on the front line of throwing everything away, meaning their lives, to preserve the kingdom and to protect the king. He says, this Yid who came into me second is a ben Torah. He's a Torah, he learned on Lubavitch, he said. And this Litva Shirov tells him that Abayim selected their Nishamas especially for Mesiris Nefesh. This is Kadetsky Karpas. These are the soldiers who are expected to throw their lives away for Yiddishkeit. I'm not going to give him a heter. He has to be Mesir Nefesh for Shabbos. And Heichel returned to the community of Leningrad understanding quite well why it was that the Rebbe said, vote for this Oyle Misharov. And as I told you earlier, it later turned out that he, in fact, was incredibly involved in the Friedrich Rebbe's activities. If you read the previous Rebbe's letters, you will read that there was a committee of five who worked with the previous Rebbe on preserving Yiddishkeit. One of those five men, all big Tamil Chacham and big Oynim, was this Haraf Clemens who sat in on meetings where the previous Rebbe oversaw the meetings and just for the record, the secretary of many of those meetings was a young man by the name of Mem Shin. He eventually was uh, tortured and exhausted and he had to escape and he ended up in Etisrael where he lived out his years.